Hello, I'm doing a book review, and the book I want to review is Watchmen. Now, Watchmen is a graphic novel written by Alan Moore and illustrated by Dave Gibbons and published by DC Comics. Now, this was first published as a 12-issue comic book series between the years 1986 and 1987, and then later on, all 12 issues were collected into one graphic novel or trade paperback. Now, Watchmen is probably one of the most influential comic books ever written. In a lot of ways, this changed the industry at the time, and the comic book world is still kind of feeling the effects of Watchmen even today. I would say both this and Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns really sort of created what we now think of as the dark and gritty superhero story, for better or worse. Now, Watchmen also, along with stuff like Art Spiegelman's Mouse, and Neil Gaiman's Sandman series showed that comic books not only can be for adults, but can tell very complex and mature stories and can be political or philosophical or can even qualify as literature. In fact, Watchmen is the only graphic novel to be included on Time Magazine's list of the top 100 best novels of the 20th century. Now, Alan Moore would probably not appreciate me saying this, because I know he's really distanced himself from the stuff he did for DC, but in my opinion, Watchmen is his masterpiece. I know some people would probably say V for Vendetta or From Hell, but in my personal opinion, Watchmen is Alan Moore's best work. This is also one of my top 10 favorite books of all time. Now, Alan Moore also probably wouldn't appreciate me calling this a graphic novel, because I know he really doesn't like that term. And even I'll admit, the term graphic novel does get used way, way too much. Even I'm guilty of overusing the term, and I will agree, if you are one of those people who says, oh, it's not a comic book, it's a graphic novel, then you are kind of a douchebag. But that being said, I'm comfortable calling Watchmen a graphic novel because if there ever was a comic where the term graphic novel applied, it would be Watchmen. Yes, Watchmen was originally published as a 12-issue comic book series, but put together, those 12 issues tell one self-contained story, and it really does kind of read like a novel. In fact, after each chapter or issue, there is sort of supplemental material, and it does kind kind of go from being a comic book to an actual prose novel. So again, Alan Moore might say I'm full of shit for calling it a graphic novel, but again, I can call it a graphic novel because in my opinion, Watchmen is a masterpiece of literature. And one of the things I love about this is there are so many different ways to read Watchmen. It is both a critique and a breakdown of the superhero genre, while simultaneously being a love letter to the genre and to comic books in general. But Watchmen is also a thought-provoking science fiction novel. It's a political satire on Cold War politics and on society in general. It's also a murder mystery and a psychological thriller. It's a character study and a character drama. And it's such a multi-layered story, and there are so many different themes at work in Watchmen, and I've read the book four times now, and each time I read it, I get something new out of it. Now, Watchmen was originally going to be something much different. There was a comic book company called Charlton that by the mid-80s was going out of business. So, DC bought the rights to several characters previously owned by Charlton Comics. Now, Alan Moore at this point was already doing some groundbreaking work for DC with his run on Swamp Thing, which he worked on with Stephen Pissett and John Tullabin and Rick Veach. So, DC ended up hiring Alan Moore to write a story featuring the Charlton characters, so he wrote a story very similar to what would later become Watchmen, but when they saw that he killed off some of these characters, they were like, hey, we might want to use these characters later on. So, Moore ended up making this an original story set outside of the DC universe, and he used original characters. However, a lot of the characters in Watchmen are sort of Alan Moore's reinterpretations of the Charlton characters. 
Now, I say original story, but when you find out what's actually going on, Moore did borrow a lot from an Outer Limits episode called The Architects of Fear. And Moore does include a shout-out to this Outer Limits episode at the end of the comic. Now, what the plot of Watchmen is it's set in 1985, but specifically the 1985 of an alternate universe. It's set in an alternate universe where superheroes exist and have existed since the late 1930s, but were outlawed in the late 1970s because of police riots and civil unrest with the exception of superheroes that are legally sanctioned by the government. Also in this universe, America won the Vietnam War due to the help of a godlike entity called Dr. Manhattan, and Richard Nixon is still president in 1985 because he did away with term limits. Now, at the beginning of the story, a superhero employed by the government known as the Comedian is murdered, so a former superhero turned vigilante named Rorschach starts investigating into the Comedian's murder. And Rorschach starts to believe that there might be a killer out there picking off former costumed heroes, and eventually these investigations lead to an even more horrifying conclusion. Now, while all this is going on, tensions between the United States and the Soviet Soviet Union have escalated to a point where it seems like World War III is imminent. So you have this murder mystery dealing with superheroes, but it's set with the backdrop of a world that is quickly approaching nuclear Armageddon. Now, as I said before, the comic really does break down the superhero concept and really turns the concept on its ear. And the book gives an arguably realistic portrait of what would it be like if superheroes existed? Like, if superheroes existed, how would that affect society? How would that affect culture and politics, and how would that affect the individual putting on the costume? Like, what would be the psychological effects of being a superhero? The book also breaks down the concept in the sense that some of these so-called heroes of Watchmen really aren't heroes at all. Some of them are downright terrible people, especially the comedian. When you find out about his past, the comedian was a scumbag. Also in the book, there's a character named Hollis Mason, who is a retired superhero. He was actually the first Night Owl when superheroes first started to show up, and he writes an autobiography called Under the Hood, and in the first few chapters of Watchmen, you get excerpts from Under the Hood, and you find out in his autobiography that a lot of the first superheroes did not get into it for virtuistic reasons or for noble reasons. A lot of them got into it really because it was sort of a fad in the late 30s and early 40s. And even worse, some of them got into it simply for the power. Also, you find out that a lot of the original Minutemen, which is what the first superheroes called themselves, they had views that were very right-wing. Now, I'm pretty sure Alan Moore leans more towards the left, so that is a sign that Moore didn't really want us to completely root for these characters. At the same time, it never really comes off like he's really judging any of these characters. Rather, he's showing them as they are. Boy, I think Alan Moore is trying to say here is regardless of what your views are, I don't think anybody wants somebody else dictating their morality on them, and that's one of the big problems with the whole concept of superheroes. Also, in a lot of traditional superhero stories, there really isn't a gray area. There usually is a defined good and evil. But what Alan Moore is saying with Watchmen is no, in real life there is no black and white. But perhaps the biggest theme in Watchmen is this idea that the people we look up to, or the people we choose to protect us, or the people we put in power, are just as bad, if not worse, than we are. Now, besides being a superhero story, Watchmen is also very much a science fiction novel, and like all great science fiction, it asks the question, where are we headed as a people? Where are we headed as a society? And it's also very much about the Cold War, and about the threat of nuclear annihilation. In a lot of ways, I would rank this with other Cold War science fiction stories. Even though these are movies I'm about to bring up, you could very much compare Watchmen to something like The Day the Earth Still still, or the original Godzilla, or Dr. Strangelove. 
And the book is also very much about the fallacy and also the true horror of the nuclear arms race. Like, during the Cold War, it was almost like both sides, the United States and the Soviet Union, were so terrified of one taking the other over that they were willing to completely annihilate that other nation, even if it meant destroying the entire world in the process. And the book also asks this horrifying question, if there is a nuclear holocaust, then what good was humanity? What was even the point of the human race if it was all leading to that? And putting this in context of a superhero story, what good were superheroes if it was all leading to a nuclear war? And is the existence of superheroes not making the world situation even worse? Now, as I said, Richard Nixon is a minor character in the story, and you get an interesting alternate history look where it's like, okay, what if Nixon was still president in the 1980s, where in real life, we were kind of at the height of the Cold War, so what would that have been like had Nixon still been president at that time? And Nixon in the story is very much used as sort of a stand-in for Reagan. Now, I'll talk more about the Cold War themes of the graphic novel, when I discuss the character of Dr. Manhattan, because he's the character where those themes are literally embodied. Now, to go back to those ideas that the people we consider to be heroes might be just as bad, if not worse, than we are, we can't talk about those ideas without talking about the character of Edward Blake, or the comedian. Now, the comedian's an interesting character in the sense that he dies in the beginning of the story, yet there are so many flashbacks where his presence is really felt throughout the entire comic. And the comedian's a bad guy. He's a really, really freaking bad guy. Like, you find out in the story that he attempted to rape Sally Jupiter, who is Laurie's mother, who was the first Silk Spectre. You also find out in Vietnam he gunned down a Vietnamese woman that he apparently had been fucking, who was pregnant with, apparently, his child. And the comedian, he's a bastard, he's a despicable human being, yet he's a three-dimensional character. And again, this goes to this idea that it never seems like Alan Moore is really judging any of these characters, because the comedian does actually have some humanizing moments in the story. Like, there are moments in the story where it seemed like he knew he was a monster, and he seemed to genuinely regret what he was. Now, what the comedian also has a very nihilistic view of the world. He views humanity as a cosmic joke, that there's really no point in humanity. He also views the extinction of man as being inevitable because of nuclear weapons. Like, the way he sees it, we're essentially doomed by our own nature, so he has become sort of a parody of humanity, hence why he calls himself the comedian. Now, Alan Moore's version of the Joker from Batman the Killing Joke does seem to have a very similar philosophy to that of the comedian. Now, the character of Rorschach has kind of become the fan favorite, and he is a very interesting character, but I think people have kind of missed the point of this character. I don't think Alan Moore necessarily wants us to root for Rorschach. A lot of people view Rorschach as being the true hero of Watchmen, and I'm not really sure if Alan Moore wants us to completely root for this character. Because Rorschach is a complete psychopath. In a lot of ways, he's a subversion of a lot of vigilante archetypes. Now, with that being said, he is a sympathetic character. You find out that he was the victim of child abuse, and there was a certain event that really set him over the edge, and when you find out what that was... Honestly, you do get where he's coming from. And like the comedian, he does have humanizing moments. But Rorschach also has a very black and white view of the world. And one of the main points of the story is that the world isn't black and white. And actually, Rorschach's views on the world is kind of his downfall by the end of the story. Now, I've heard some critics say that Rorschach is also supposed to be racist, and I never really got that from the character. Like, he is very right-wing, but I never really got that he was a racist. 
I guess arguments in favor of Rorschach being a racist might come from the fact that in the story you find out he subscribes to a right-wing newspaper, and after one of the chapters in this book, you do get excerpts from this newspaper, and you see an article kind of defending the Ku Klux Klan. But just because he has some right-wing views doesn't automatically make him a racist. The way I kind of view Rorschach is he's somebody who's so dead set in his views that he kind of refuses to see the bad in somebody that he admires. And you kind of see that in his investigations into the comedian's murder, because you really do get this idea that he did idolize the comedian, because the comedian was somebody who fought for his country. And he kind of refuses to accept this possibility that the comedian could have been a rapist. And Rorschach's certainly not somebody who's pro-rape, because you find out that he murdered a rapist, and you'll also see him violently murder a child molester at one point in this comic. Like, Rorschach views the people he agrees with in such a light that he sort of overlooks things that he would normally disagree with if they were anybody else. Now, while Rorschach is definitely the fan favorite, for me the most compelling character in this book is Dr. Manhattan. Now, Dr. Manhattan is the only character in the book who actually has superpowers. The other so-called superheroes of Watchmen are just regular people who have dressed up in costumes and started fighting crime. Dr. Manhattan's the only character that you would call a traditional superhero, as in he has supernatural powers. Now, in the comic, you eventually find out that he was a nuclear physicist named John Osserman, who ended up getting killed in this accident that completely destroyed his body on an atomic level, like it tore him apart atom by atom. But he somehow managed to bring himself back to life, but when he came back, he came back as this being with godlike abilities. Now, in the story, Dr. Manhattan is very much a metaphor for the atomic bomb. The same way that in real life, when the atomic bomb was first created, it changed society as we knew it. In the universe of the story, when Dr. Manhattan first shows up, it changes the world. And in the story, the U.S. government uses Dr. Manhattan as a living nuclear deterrent. Also, he was America's weapon that helped win the Vietnam War in the fictional universe of this story. The same way that in real life, the atomic bomb was what got Japan to surrender at the end of World War II. In fact, Dr. Manhattan is named after the Manhattan Project. So in that sense, you could really compare Watchmen to something like the original Godzilla from Ishiro Honda. In that original film, Godzilla was a metaphor for the bomb. The creature itself was a Essentially, the nuclear bomb made flesh. I also think it's interesting that before Dr. Manhattan shows up, it seems like the world of Watchmen is a relatively realistic universe, but once Dr. Manhattan shows up, it changes the world in such a way where the world of Watchmen becomes more of a heightened reality, as if the existence of Dr. Manhattan has changed the reality itself. And in the story, you see how Dr. Manhattan is descending further and further from human reality. He perceives reality so differently from humans that he's finding it harder and harder to relate to humans. In a way, he's sort of the downside of what it would be like to be a god, because Watchmen shows that you do not want to be like Dr. Manhattan. But perhaps the most terrifying thing about Dr. Manhattan is how he perceives time. For him, time is non-linear. It's this idea that the past, the present, and the future all exist simultaneously, and we as humans, we don't really have any free will. We have the illusion of free will, but everything that we're going to do in the future is already what we were going to do. Manhattan even says at one point, we are all puppets, but I'm a puppet who can see the strings. Now, Alan Moore would play around with this concept of time again in his graphic novel From Hell. Now, that concept of time, when you really stop to think about it, is a very grim and pessimistic view on reality. But there is this subtle hint in the story that maybe John has it wrong, and maybe we do have more free will than it seems. 
And in the story, John essentially becomes God, but the question is, what kind of God is he to become? Will he become a God like the Christians or the Muslims or the Jews believe in? A God where we're part of his plan? Or will he be more like the Lovecraftian gods? Now, H.P. Lovecraft was an atheist in real life, but in his stories he presented this idea that if gods did exist, we would be so insignificant to them that they would barely even have contempt for us. Like, if gods really did exist, we would barely even be ants to them. And in the story, you see John getting dangerously close to becoming almost like a Lovecraftian god, where he loses all touch with humanity, and humanity becomes so insignificant to him that he doesn't do anything to try to save it. But there's also something kind of horrifying about a god or god having human emotions, because we as humans barely seem to be able to know what to do with something like atomic power, so can you imagine what it would actually be like if a human being really did become like God is. Then you have the character of Osmantius, or Adrian Veidt, who's also a very interesting character. Now, Dan and Laurie, they're good characters, and actually Laurie's a very important character in the story, but they're not as broken as some of the other characters are, so... I can't really talk about them, at least not the same way I would Comedian or Rorschach or Dr. Manhattan. But I do think it's interesting how there's a scene in the book where Dan and Lori try to have sex, but they really can't because Dan is shown to be impotent. But then when they dress up in costume and go out and save these people from a burning building, only then can they have sex. But what's so cool about this is this is such a character-driven story. It's almost more of a character piece than it is a plot-driven story. And there are so many different subplots in here that seem like they have nothing to do with the main plot, but as it all comes together, you realize, no, actually those subplots were really integral to the story. And there are parts where the narrative really does focus on some of these minor characters and gets to a point where these minor characters feel just as important as the main characters. I actually think Alan Moore is very similar to Stephen King in that regard because in a lot of Stephen King novels, even minor characters get their own moments to shine. Like, in the book, there's this subplot about a news vendor and this kid reading a comic, and the news vendor's sitting there talking about these really important issues and talking about what's going on between the United States and the Soviet Union and this idea of, is World War III inevitable? Yet this kid is just sitting there reading this comic book and completely ignoring this old man. And these sections of the book involving these two characters might seem like they have nothing to do with anything, but these scenes are actually really important for the themes of the story. Now, this comic book that the kid is reading is a horror pirate comic called Tales of the Black Freighter, and there's certain points where you see the comic that he's reading, and it basically becomes a story within the story. And you realize what's going on in the Tales of the Black Freighter comic symbolizes what's actually going on in the universe of Watchmen. And what's interesting is the writer of the Tales of the Black Freighter comic also plays a pretty important role in the story. Also, the last scene involving the news vendor and this kid is actually really moving. But it's not even just them. There's a point in the story where Rorschach ends up getting arrested and a psychologist is analyzing him and you get a lot of character development with this psychologist. There's a point where you start following this lesbian couple who are having severe troubles in their relationship. So it's such a rich and multi-layered story and again, it's such a character-driven story. Now, I must say that the ending of Watchmen, like, when you find out what the villain's plan is, when you find out who the villain is and what his plan is, it is very, very outlandish. Now, I heard somewhere that Alan Moore kind of pulled the ending out of his ass because he was getting so much praise on this comic that he wanted to see if he could get away with how outlandish the ending was. At the same time, I'm not sure if I really buy that, because as weird as the ending is, it is set up throughout the comic. 
Like, there is actually a lot of foreshadowing. Now, in the graphic novel, you get this real sort of clash between philosophies, between pessimism or nihilism versus optimism. Like, there are moments in the book where it seems like it's portraying this real pessimistic or even nihilistic view of humanity, but then there are some actually really good arguments in the book against pessimism. Ultimately, I think Alan Moore is leaving that up to you, what the book is actually trying to say. And even by the end of the book, you're not sure if this is an uplifting ending or a downbeat ending, because you're not really sure what happens right after the ending of this comic. Now, basically by the end of this story, and this is a minor spoiler, but basically by the end, peace between the United States and the Soviet Union is achieved and nuclear war is averted, but you don't know if this peace is going to last. Really, it's all left up to chance, which is ironic because if you listen to Dr. Manhattan, there is no chance. Everything is already preordained. So the ending, and ultimately what the book is trying to say about humanity, is ultimately left up to the reader's interpretation. Now, while Watchmen is a great psychological character drama and a great Cold War science fiction novel, Watchmen is also very much a comic about comics. This is is very much about the comic book medium. Because in the book, you find out that the original Minutemen, like the first superheroes, they were inspired by superhero comics. So it was life literally imitating art, and it was almost as if the comic books have come to life. And the book also talks about how the comic book industry in this universe is affected by these real-world superheroes. Like, because superheroes actually exist in the universe of Watchmen, superhero comics have pretty much become obsolete. So instead, horror and pirate comics dominate the comic book industry. And that's another significant thing about the Tales of the Black Freighter story. Now, I'm almost a half hour into this video, and I haven't even really mentioned Dave Gibbons' artwork yet. Which is kind of a sin, because his artwork is fantastic. Now, even though I do think comics and graphic novels can count as literature, what does separate comics and graphic novels from traditional novels is the fact that they really are nothing without their artist. And even though I've been given most of the credit to Alan Moore, Watchmen, even with its dark themes, would be nothing without Dave Gibbons' art. But yeah, Watchmen is not just an amazing comic, but an amazing piece of literature. There's a reason this is considered by many people to be the greatest comic book or graphic novel ever made. And even though I've been talking about the book now for almost a half hour, I barely even scratch the surface. Like, you could spend six hours talking about this book, and even then you might not do this book a justice. Now, there have been other comic books featuring the Watchmen characters not written by Alan Moore. Like, a few years ago, you had the Before Watchmen comics, which acted as prequels to Watchmen. Now, that comic did have some good writers attached to it, like J. Michael Strinsky and Len Wein, who is the co-creator of Swamp Thing, and Brian Asarello. Now, I've never read the Before Watchmen series because, and this is going to make me sound really elitist, but honestly, I don't like the idea of them doing more Watchmen comics without Alan Moore. And yes, it is technically within DC's rights to do it because they do legally own the rights to these characters, and they were the ones who originally hired Alan Moore to write Watchmen, and yes, the characters in Watchmen are technically Alan Moore's reinterpretation of the Charlton characters. It just doesn't feel right to me, but again, that's just my opinion. Now, later on, Dr. Manhattan did actually end up getting incorporated into the mainstream DC universe, and I don't personally like that. And recently you had the comic book series Doomsday Clock that officially crosses over the Watchmen characters with the DC universe. And again, I don't really like that idea. I don't really like the idea of any of the characters from Watchmen having anything to do with the DC universe. Yes, it is owned by DC, but to me Watchmen is completely its own entity. I guess Doomsday Clock has every right to exist, but I don't personally count that as canon. And yes, I'm well aware that I probably sound like a butthurt fanboy right now. 
Now, Watchmen had a 2009 film adaptation from Zack Snyder. It also inspired the 2019 HBO series of the same name, and I'll talk about both of those after I play a series of short reviews on this book done by different friends of mine who are also big fans of this book. The first short review you're going to see is from college professor William Burns. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Bill Burns, and... Uh, Christian asked me to share my thoughts on uh, Watchmen, and as I could probably go on for hours, I won't do that, and I'll try to keep it brief. Um, Alan Moore has always been one of my favorite authors, um, not just comic book author, but favorite author, period. And I think that Watchmen is one of the greatest novels of the 20th century. I think it's up there with 1984, Lolita, Clockwork Orange, Crash. Um, in terms of my uh, encounter with Watchmen, I actually started with issue number three as it came out on the, you know, to the newsstand, as they used to say. Um, I actually had to backtrack and get the first two issues. But at the time, Watchmen wasn't really, like, super promoted, not like how uh, things are now. I remember there was a button set. Um, I think at the time, DC had a role-playing game, and there was a Watchmen module. Uh, they were, like, little miniatures, little, like, silver miniatures, and I think there was a poster of, of course, the iconic, uh, you know, smiley face button with the blood on it. So uh, every month I impatiently waited. I couldn't wait to see what was going to happen in this series. Um, the last issue was actually delayed. So that was even more nerve wracking. It was like torture waiting to see how this all was going to, you know, um, come to a conclusion. For me, um, my favorite issue, or the issue that uh, affected me most, is probably issue number six, with the one where uh, you learn we we learn Rorschach's uh, origins. And at the time, I maybe I was I think I was like sixteen years old at the time. I had never really seen something so real, so authentic in a comic book. You know, I just felt so much sympathy for this character. You know, it just it was so genuine. You know, to see the the abuse and to see um, just the the tragedy that was Rorschach's life and how it, it informed him. And made him into the man he was. Um, and again, I mean, seeing this is this is people really go through these things in you know in our reality. You know, it's not uh, that they you know get bit by a radioactive spider and that's what t turns them into a superhero. You know, in our society, you know, uh, traumas create very different types of people. You know, not just superheroes, but also you know um, people that have deep emotional and psychological problems. And I think I'd never seen that before. I mean, they had alluded to this in terms of maybe Frank Miller's Dark Knight had alluded to the fact that Bruce Wayne had these these traumas, you know, seeing his parents die, had created this almost psychosis in him to be a superhero. But it had never been so um, explicit, I guess, as as the way Rorschach's origins were portrayed in, in issue number six. Uh, the other thing that really struck me at the time when I read it was, of course, the structure of the narrative. You know, it was very confusing to me. You know, this this idea of the uh, uh, the simultaneous nature of time, how past, present, and, and future are not linear uh, stages, nor are they cyclical, but actually are parallel uh, to each other. You know, and I think that's also reflected in the self reflective nature of the actual work, right? We have this sort of the, the work itself constantly comments on itself, like, you know, the tales of the black freighter, the recurring symbols in, in, in images. Um, so it's this idea that, it, you know, it, though we sort of experience time in one way, it doesn't mean that that's what the nature of time is, right? We can only go through our perception in terms of what reality is, right? And of course, that's the tragedy of Dr. Manhattan, right? He's able to see these things. We're not. We're like in the middle of it, but he's able to sort of almost get above these things, right? And he has these godlike powers, but he can't change time, you know? Everything has already happened. And so, you know, all he can do is just observe, right? He's... In some ways, he's the most powerful, but also at the same time, he's the most powerless because he can't change the narrative. It's already happened. And of course, this notion of time also informs uh, From Hell, right? Alan Moore's other masterpiece of many masterpieces. This idea uh, that we are haunted by the future. You know, it's almost like ghosts are actually not just from the past, but also the future. Um, I'm also amazed at how uh, Alan Moore could plant these little seeds early in the narrative that actually blossom unexpectedly in, you know, in, in these sh incredible ways later in the series. Um, to me, that's what makes rereading Watchmen such an incredible experience, you know, to sort of see how these things actually come to fruition. 
Um, you know, it, it, Moore's attention to detail is staggering. I mean, how could he have planned these like little resonating plot devices that don't, you know, there's such little things early on, but then later on become such huge, important moments in the series. Um, and know, was he able to sort of see that? Is, is he almost like a Dr. Manhattan himself and can see across the, the time streams? Um, and I, I think a lot of, um, um, a lot of praise should go to Dave Gibbons, right? Because his ability to sort of um, uh, show us these things and sort of make these things come alive in the, the narrative, which could have become very confusing, could have become uh, very sort of um, off-putting. He makes very real. His artwork, I think, in the series is just uh, wonderful. Um, in... Alan Moore's works, I, there are no coincidences, right? So you might say to yourself, well, it's just a coincidence that, you know, he put this little uh, plot device or a symbol or this little idea at the beginning and it came to, you know, it came to grow later on. But it, that's not how Alan Moore works. Like everything is connected. Um, in his works, symmetry and synchronicity um, are very important. And, you know, it's funny because Moore, uh, you know, has you know said that he's a magician right and i think in in a way he really is and we see this through his work that his work really is the idea that like alistair crowley said of sort of you know um, the art and science of making change and conformity with will and that's what he does right that his symbols actually become like sigils right they they sigils and they become empowered through the repetitive use of them that you see throughout the the actual uh, the narrative themselves. That's how they become empowered is through that repetitious use of them. And so, yeah, so maybe Moore had become a magician even earlier than he uh, stated to the world. Um, I also found it unbelievable that um, he concluded both Watchmen and Miracle Man at the same time. But I think these two series are the ultimate ruminations on the superhero phenomenon. And Watchmen, superheroes have to be outlawed, right? Or they have to be co-opted because regular human beings can't deal with these supreme beings, right? It's just, we can't deal with them. They engender fear and hate and envy in regular human beings. Uh, in Miracle Man, uh, superheroes realize that the planet can't be left in the hands of inferior beings. Uh, and so they take over. They become gods to us, you know, that they can't leave this important, you know, um, this the, the importance of the world in the hands of, of people who do uh, fear and hate and, and have envy. So they take over. They create this sort of like paradise on Earth. And so to me, the, the both both those options are very pessimistic. I have a, a very pessimistic view of humanity. But, you know, Alan, that's Alan Moore's view. I feel that Watchmen still has uh, is very prescient. It, it sort of uh, predicted a lot of um, social ideas that would later, you know, become much more important in the 21st century, you know, especially in terms of the idea of, you know, who are superheroes? Who are these people who are authority figures? Who are these people that are supposedly protecting our freedoms? Are they taking away our freedoms in the name of protection? You know, and, you know, things like the Patriot Act or things like, you know, meddling in uh, elections or people using social media to track and sort of, you know, um, and spy on people. Uh, I think it's an important question to ask ourselves is, you know, who watches The Watchmen? This is Christian Feliciano giving his thoughts on Alan Moore's Watchmen. The thing I love about Watchmen is the same thing I love about the X-Men. These are stories that show you exactly how superheroes would be treated if they existed in the real world. X-Men, yes, is more fantastical because there's these big climactic battles with aliens and ancient mummies and time travel and all this crazy stuff. But the way they're treated is very realistic. They're persecuted against they're hated, they're thrown in jail, they're killed, just because they're different. And of course, Watchmen is on the opposite end of that, where these heroes are human. Except for one, Dr. Manhattan is a, is pretty much, you know, an all-powerful god. But the rest of them are human, you know, and they are flawed. They do do evil things. So the fact that um, they're persecuted against is more understandable, but at the same time, um, you know, that's how they would be in the real world. If superheroes really existed to this level, I know there's superheroes in real life who dress up, they feed the homeless and stuff like that. But I'm talking about if they existed to this level where there's like a Justice League of heroes who go out and fight supervillains and you know, really fight crime and, you know, together with their ships and their technology and stuff like that, that this is how exactly how they would be. Um, Rorschach, for example, is a Batman-like character, but he's conservative and he's a killer. He goes, he's just a psychopath. You know, the comedian is a psychopath, but at the same time has this philosophy about the world that is like a joke. You know, Dr. Manhattan is, 
is this all powerful being who doesn't really care about anything anymore because he's so powerful. He's the Superman character, pretty much. Why would a superhero who has all these powers, why would he care about such insignificant creatures like us when he could explore the universe, when he could do a lot more stuff, when he could create life? You know, he could live on his own exploring the universe. Um, then, of course, you see uh, Night Owl, who is incompetent, he's impotent, he's um, uh, self-conscious, you know, and you have, you know, he's in love with uh, Silk Spectre, who, of course, has her own issues um, in life and has her own issues with her mother. And you get to see these characters for who they really are. And I love that about Alan Moore, because when he came into comic books, he his whole idea was he wanted to destroy the concept of the superhero. He felt that superheroes is a bad concept. You should never rely on somebody else to save you. You should really get yourself out of situations. If you're going to protest, you should be out there protesting, fighting for rights and stuff like that, not relying on other people to do it for you, which is pretty much my philosophy, too. Um, as much as I love comic books, I always... I've always had an issue with superheroes because the idea that we look up to these gods and trust them too much is dangerous. Because at the end of the day, if you trust them too much and they turn against you, what do you do then? You're screwed. But, um, you know, I love that he does that in this book. He showcases that beautifully. And his writing is fantastic. Uh, these characters, very realistic. None of them are flat. I mean, they're just, you know, completely compl complicated because even in the sense that, you know, like Rorschach, Rorschach is um, very conservative. He's very violent, a psychopath. But at the same time, his philosophy, there's parts of his philosophy that you understand that you can sympathize with. And, um, you know, then, of course, with the comedian, as much as you hate that character because he does hateful things in his book, there's a philosophy there that you could kind of understand this idea that the world is a big joke and, and all this stuff like you, you can kind of see it, you know, from his point of view, you just understand that point, you know? And then of course, Dr. Manhattan, you understand why this big Superman character um, exists and, and why he wouldn't see life as interesting anymore. Why he would get bored with us because he is this all powerful God, like, you know, like a, like Superman, like Thor, like something like that. And why would he care? anymore about saving us when he has a whole universe to explore, when he could create life himself and he could do all this stuff. And then Ozymandias being this rich, you know, billionaire guy, why would he really, why would he just focus on small crime when he could try to save the world? And I love how he goes to save the world because, you know, no spoilers, but it, it, it's very realistic. This is not, you know, stopping meteors with your fist. This is not, you know, stopping earthquakes by jumping under the ocean and doing some crazy stuff, you know. This is what would happen. You know, how do you save the world when the world, when the world is our world? It's the realistic world. You know, I love that, that Alan Moore shows you this, you know, this idea that sometimes you have to do, you know, desperate times calls for, call for desperate measures. And the funny thing about that was that when I was a kid and I first read this book, I thought Ozymandias was, you know, a real douchebag for what he does in this book. And as I get older, I realized that, no, in, in, in the real world, that's how it would be. That's, that's pretty much to save the world. He's the hero of the story. You know, he saves the world. He does what we have all been looking for in comic books. You know, for somebody to save the world, you know, and that's that's what people pray for. That's what people look for. That's what people want in the world to save it. But to save it, you have to do things that are not so great, you know, and it's a sad thing to say. But at the same time, you know, that's that's pretty much how life is. And that's pretty much how um, how you would have to do it. And I love that that. Alan Moore does it. Now it's a crazy, crazy way that it happens, but I just love, I just love it because it's a comic book at the end of the day, you know, as much as it's realistic, you know, it's a comic book. You got to do crazy things. The story is paced very well, in my opinion. Um, I know some people who think it's slow, but you know, it's nice because it's about the characters. It's really showing you a lot of character development. Uh, that's something you don't get out of many comics because a lot of comics are very uh, story driven, very plot driven, I should say, not story driven, but plot driven, where there's a villain and then you got to take down the villain. And yeah, there's some conflict within the characters themselves, but 
for the most part, it's about taking down the villain. That's really the, the, the story, you know. Um, this is more about the characters and them going through their trials and tribulations and see where they go with all this stuff that's going on. It's a it's very well paced for me. The artwork is beautiful. Uh, Dave Givens is just one of the greats. He draws it so beautifully. It feels like a Vertigo book because it's so realistic the way it's drawn. But um, yeah, it's just beautiful. And, and the world, you know, it's not all beautiful or and shiny and all that stuff. It's ugly, you know, so he does show you the ugly side of things. He does draw it in a way that kind of reminds you of New York. If you remember New York before they really cleaned it up, that's how it, it looked. Um, the characters look exactly how you would look in real life. You know, the characters are uh, overweight or they're, you know, starting to get older. They're starting to get, um, you know, they're not all these these very muscle bound guys that are extremely handsome or they're not extremely beautiful. You know, the women, um, they're not extremely curvy, all this stuff like, you know, they're drawn realistically. I love that about the artwork. This book really is a masterpiece. I mean, it's it's completely, in my opinion, flawless. There's nothing wrong with it. I've read it many times. It's not my favorite of the Alan Moore books. My favorite is V for Vendetta. But this one is just, I mean, it's fantastic. It is it is everything everybody always tells you. They always say, if you've never read a comic book, the one you should read is Watchmen. Very true. Um, I would say that more than V for Vendetta. Because V for Vendetta can be a hard read for some people. Because of the crypto anarchy stuff and all, you know, just a long rambling story sometimes, our philosophy and stuff. So, you know, for people, for normal people, I would say no. But if you like that kind of stuff, if you're used to comics and all that, V for Vendetta is for you. But this is not a V for Vendetta review, so let me get out of that. Uh, Watchmen is definitely a book that you can pick up, especially if you're one of those people who just loves story. Um, you just love characters. You just want to get, you know, find, meet some characters and get to know them. And then, of course, you know, leave them when the story ends. This is perfect for you because you don't have to pick up any other books. I know there's other Watchmen books out there. There's sequels and stuff, which are good. But still, you know, you don't have to read those. Those came out 30 years later or whatever it was. Um, you could just read this book and end it. You know, you go from beginning, middle, end, and then you're done. You know, so if you've never read a comic book before, you want to read a comic book, this is the perfect one for you. It's about 12 issues long. It's a little long considering the fact that it is a comic book. I know most comics are pretty short and there's more dialogue in this one than, than in most comic books. But this is a perfect read for you if you've never read one before. If you have read comics and you've never read Watchmen, go read Watchmen. I mean, if you've always wanted to read it, but you just you just never got around to it, put down whatever you're reading. And check this book out because this is one of the greats. This is the epic story that you've been looking for. Um, it's up there with Dark Knight Returns. It's up there with um, the Swamp Thing Saga. It's up, thing, uh, it's up there with League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Um, it just is an amazing, amazing book. And I highly recommend that you pick this up. You'll enjoy it. You really will. This is my friend Jeremy giving his thoughts on Watchmen. Now, this review is also on his YouTube channel, which I'll leave a link to in the description below. Hey, everyone. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. So today, I decided to do a book review, and the book I'd like to review today is Watchmen by Alan Moore. Now, I'll admit, I didn't know about this graphic novel until after I saw the movie way back in 2009, but even so, I can proudly say that I became a huge fan of it when I did read it shortly after seeing the film. This is one of my all-time favorite graphic novels, and easily one of the greatest graphic novels ever written. I know this has probably been said many times before, but it really did an amazing job of bringing superheroes into the real world and presenting them as more human than super. These characters are definitely not your traditional superheroes, as they are deeply flawed characters, and some of them are outright terrible people. I think my favorite character is definitely Rorschach. He is incredibly intense and isn't afraid to take action when necessary. But as Alan Moore put it, he also shows that, in the real world, superheroes can be scary. He is a relentless, remorseless psychopath who will not hesitate to enact horrific violence on anyone he deems to be a criminal. However, I did find myself sympathizing with him in certain instances of this, in the story, especially when I found out about his traumatizing past. 
I also really like how easily he gets under people's skin. And there's a part in the story where he gets interviewed by a therapist, and you can tell that over time, the therapist gets warped by dealing with him. He's definitely a very compelling character, although definitely not one you'd want to meet in a dark alley. To me, he's the main character of the story because he's the one who's actively investigating the events that occur uh, throughout it, and he's the one who I believe we get to know the most. Another character whom I find intriguing, although definitely not likable, is the comedian. He is a despicable human being, and he's not afraid to show it. And yet, as one critic put it, he's definitely capable of greater insight than the other characters. In one scene in the story, he recognizes the uselessness of costumed heroes and berates the other characters for it. Like I said before, he's definitely not a likable character, but he is an interesting one. The artwork in this graphic novel by Dave Gibbons is also phenomenal. It's very detailed and really helps bring you into the story. There are a lot of themes present throughout the story, uh, and the one I want to talk about today is the abuse of power. A lot of these characters, whether they're costumed heroes or regular people, blatantly abuse their power. An example of this is the story's version of Richard Nixon using Dr. Manhattan to win the war in Vietnam, which, as Manhattan puts it, is something that none of his predecessors would ever do. The U.S. government also uses Dr. Manhattan to flaunt their powers to their enemies. And Rorschach, as I mentioned before, is a psychopath who won't hesitate to violate laws he claims to uphold in order to meet his goals. This is evident when he breaks into the home of Edgar Jacobi, a.k.a. Moloch, who was an old enemy of the comedian, and terrorizes the poor man. Dr. Manhattan abuses his power as well, such as when he forcefully sends a group of protesters back to their homes by teleporting them. Another theme that I want to talk about is the fact that none of these characters are really heroes. You know, um, Alan Moore gives us characters who may run around in silly costumes and beat up bad guys, but deep down... They're not so morally upright themselves. I could talk about this graphic novel forever, but since I don't want this video to be too long, I'm going to wrap it up now. But before I do, I want to talk about the time I got Alan Moore's autograph. Way back in 2013, I printed out pictures of the covers for Watchmen and Batman the Killing Joke. Sometime later, I got them returned to me, unsigned, with a letter from his assistant saying that because he doesn't own the rights to these works, he doesn't sign them. However, he also sent back a signed copy of his, at the time, newest graphic novel, Heart of I Nemo, Heart of Ice, which I still have my, in my collection to this day. It says, For Jeremy, with best wishes and apologies, from Alan Moore. Here's my friend John giving his thoughts on Alan Moore's Watchmen. The first time I read the uh, Watchmen comic was back in 2009 when the film came out. Because I remember when the film was coming out, I wanted to read the comic first before seeing the film to see like what was all the hype about, like why this comic book is so like, great. And when I read it, I was like, whoa, this is a great comic book, and this is a great story, and these are great characters, and this is like a mind-blowing comic book that I read that Alan Moore just blew my mind away. It's like, whoa. It just left me speechless because it was the first time I read a comic book that had sex, nudity, violence, gore, and just, oh man, and rape. I had never seen that done in a comic book before until I read this comic book. It was also like a comic book where Alan Moore was shown about how like superheroes are not perfect, they have their flaws, their ups and downs and stuff, and that... People think of superheroes as gods, whereas they are really not gods. Like, for example, the comedian. When he dies, people see him as like he was this god, this big superhero icon that had a great legacy behind. But behind closed doors, people did not realize that he was a sick, an alcoholic, and he was a murderer and a rapist. He was a sick dude. What I also like about the comic, too, is how 
Alan Moore was also expressing, showing about how, like, the world had changed the last, like, 40 years at that time, what was going on in America from, like, World War II, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, and stuff like that, etc., during the Reagan years, and he made it, like, an alternate universe, too, of, like, what if, uh, like, we had won the Vietnam War, Vietnam would have been the 51st state of the United States of America, and stuff like that, it was just, like... Yeah, Watchmen is probably, like, one of the best, uh, graphic novels, probably one of my favorite comic books I've ever read of all time, because of how just amazing and just phenomenal it is. It's just a great comic book that you feel like you can talk about a lot of things about what it has to offer, and, uh, yeah. Here is my friend Chris's review on the groundbreaking graphic novel. Keep in mind, his review is actually relatively long. Where do you even start when you're talking about Watchmen? Um... I mean, first and foremost, obviously, we get a classic superhero story. Um, we get Alan kind of playing around with the conventions of what a comic book is, both in terms of story and in terms of structure. But I think most importantly, and it's the thing that's underappreciated about it, is it's sort of an indictment of the baby boomer era. That whole, like, nom generation, that's what's kind of being put under analysis and kind of serves as the backdrop of the whole story. And you play that off of this, like, grand, cosmic, um, you know, superhero-esque story um, with Doc Manhattan and... You know, that great line about him being a puppet that can see the strings. Um, I think the best stories are always the one where there's multiple things going at once. And everything kind of interweaves to form this great sort of tapestry of character and, and theme and plot. And it's just endlessly re rereadable and uh, interesting fascinating and I think I remember somebody said like this is one of those books that you get to the end and then you immediately go back to the beginning and start reading again and um, it just speaks to Alan's brilliance that you know he's written prose but it's just something about this medium speaks to his sensibilities as a writer and I think it's because it's a marriage between the visual and the textual. Um, and because it's such a solid union of the two, it speaks so well to how he tells stories. Because his stories are always about what we are as people on this planet and sort of juxtaposing that against what the universe is and what the universe has to offer and what happens sort of in between the lines, you know, and, you know, how that informs how we live as people. Um, you know, I just got done reading The Extraordinary Gentleman uh, recently. That's, I think he wrapped it up uh, not too long ago. And... I just loved that ending rumination about what it means to be human. And you see that in, in Watchmen especially. But the thing that I love so much is let's take a real sort of straightforward, very realistic idea of here's a world where humans are fighting crime, where they're putting on these costumes and they have some of them have these powers what would that be in the real world how would they affect history how would they affect economics how would they affect crime how would they affect the crime rate um, who would they be as people and the answer is they're very flawed people and that begs the question who watches the watchman um, that line is kind of underappreciated because it's meant to imply that the people we put faith in may not deserve our faith. And that maybe it sh 
we should take a better look at the people that we put our trust in and the people that we consider leaders. Because you think about a character like the comedian who is this very flawed man who, you know, was an attempted rapist and, you know, a murderer and, uh, but strangely relatable because he's just so broken and kind of his his malice comes from a place of feeling he doesn't have a choice and um, it makes you think about really how you would respond to superheroes being in the real world Um, but something I do really want to touch on and I think it is the story's most underappreciated aspects uh, I mentioned it earlier is an indictment of the baby boomer era and you know it's so spot on with you know, Nixon still being president and, and, you know, we won NOM and, like, all these interesting alternate timeline uh, concepts. Um, it's really shocking to think that this was not written by an American because it's, it's such an intrinsically American story. And, uh, again, you know, it just it speaks to Alan's brilliance because he can do these incredible alternate history parables and it's you know it's he's he's about as British as it gets but he just he understands it for some reason he just he's a guy who kind of knows his shit um, as much as he's not for everybody Um, but I do think that it's a story about I think politics first and foremost and it's a story about superheroes second and that's what makes it so unique and so fascinating um i love the idea that there was a generation that went well but a first generation of superheroes that went fairly well but there were all these character flaws underneath it all um you know hooded justice uh was a closeted gay and he also didn't like immigrants you know he had a problem with illegal aliens and all this stuff and obviously you know a comedian had his issues and and everything and um it's crazy to think that you go into that second generation with the second night owl and the new silk specter and they're relatively better people than what came before but for some reason, they're the phoned-in generation. They they see the mistakes of their past, but they can't overcome the way those mistakes affected the world. And holy fucking shit, is that relevant to what's going on right now? <laughs> um, the idea of... Think of it as uh, kind of the Roman Empire after it fell. You know, like... Uh, Christianity swept through and, you know, they saw how decadent things got, you know, between uh, gladiators and and slavery and all this stuff, but they just could not hold on to it. You know, it was, it was a good try, but they just couldn't nail it. And that's kind of what you see happen in Watchmen is, you know, they're trying to figure out, you know, what do we do? As superheroes are we doing the right thing are we just causing more problems are we helping the world was it even necessarily a good thing that we won not or did it just encourage sort of a lot of xenophobia and and kind of blind patriotism that doesn't really do much good for anybody um it's a scary thought and i think it's the exact kind of notes you need to hit if you're going to talk about what would happen if these characters existed in the real world? Um, it the influence of it is just everywhere, man. You know, we uh, we just got a actually a surprisingly good sequel to it not too long ago, uh, Doomsday Clock, which uh, worked really well on two levels because you got you know the angular comic book fan. Okay, cool. Let's do a sick crazy crossover but you also got the seriousness of it what would happen if these two worlds merged and these characters met each other and how would the sensibilities of the two universes clash 
you know, the DC universe is fairly hopeful, but Watchmen is kind of about, it's not pessimistic, but it is sort of cynical. And, um, what happens when those two kind of ideologies clash? And the answer turned out to be fairly interesting, actually. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but the fact that this story is still relevant today and people are still enamored with it to the point where, you know, they, they had a legitimate sequel to it and a legitimate crossover with, um, you know, classic licensed characters that we all know and love. Um, it speaks just volumes to, to how great the story is. Um... Something that I do uh, want to talk about before we wrap up is the nine-panel grid. Um, the technical aspects of it where, okay, we're going to do a comic book the way a comic book is meant to be read. Uh, you know, with sort of this, this nine-panel layout and we're going to use it in a way that emphasizes how comic books tell stories. And to be able to do that in a way that shows how great the medium can be if you have the right story and if it's meant for that story. You see it all the way throughout um, so many times, uh, you know, Rorsatch's investigations and, you know, um, Adrian's ruminations and like all these great scenes that show you what comics can do for you as a writer and as a reader. Um, and it's, it's an important thing. And I, I wish honestly more comic book storytelling would be kind of dedicated to it. Yeah. You know, I'm still fascinated with the concept of doc Manhattan. Um, I love the idea of a very, a very normal yet brilliant person who ascended to this higher form of existence and it ends up leaving him fairly empty and fairly inhuman. Um, he starts basically getting bored with us and he's, he's kind of tired of what he sees as petty squabbles. Um, he obviously still has tangibility to his past life um, because he doesn't perceive time the way you and I do. But... Just the idea that he starts sort of inadvertently looking down on humans really makes you question the idea of a Superman. Because if someone got this level of power and they were able to perceive the way that Doc Manhattan perceives things, would they even give a shit about us anymore? You know, um, the concept of Superman being a god who wants to help us and wants to encourage us to be better and wants to be a symbol of hope. This is the exact opposite of that. This is a godlike being who, when push comes to shove, will help if asked, but at the end of the day, kind of doesn't give two shits. He does it because, well, why wouldn't he do it? You know, um, the puppet who can see the strings. Um, he understands that we're just sort of pawns in the vast cosmic uh, flow of things. It's, it's really fascinating. And um, I think it's just a great masterclass in, in how to write these sorts of characters. I think that there's certain stories and certain characters that could only come from the medium of comic books. Um, you know, like Watchmen is one of them. Uh, Hellboy, uh, you know, just about every fucking character from Preacher. Um, there's a lot that comics can do for you. Um, and I think it's, again, because of that great merge between text and visual. Um, and that encourages a form of storytelling and a form of character that is so unique. And it makes so much sense that this stuff just gets adapted to films and TV shows all the time. Um, you know, the boys, uh, just got made into a really great TV show. Preacher had a really good run. Um, and now, uh, Watchmen just got a, a sequel show. Uh, unfortunately I have not 
seen it yet, but I've heard great things and I'm really looking forward to watching it. I think that about wraps it up. Uh, I love this story. Uh, there's a reason that it's the only graphic novel on, I think it's Time Magazine's top 100 books ever written or top uh, top 100 uh, influential novels of all time. Because it's it's sort it almost reads like a novel, you know that that's kind of the ingenious part of it, um, and it's it's gonna be that way for a very long time. People are always gonna appreciate it because it just did so much for comics. You know, they they sort of between this Dark Knight Returns and uh, basically most of what Frank and Allen put out, sort of in that decade um it redefined what the medium was and what kind of stories you were gonna see in comics going forward and the thing that i appreciate about it is it's this perfect marriage between imagination and rumination you know um you're seeing these crazy colorful characters and these insane fantasy situation so you get that thrill seeker adventure aspect from it but you also get these deep themes and these very um interesting questions about humanity and and you know world history and what we might be capable of when it comes to conflict and uh, i think for that reason it's it's definitely always going to be appreciated. So, I hope you enjoyed my friend's reviews on Watchmen. I know some of them were kind of on the long side, but this is already a long-ass video, so if you stuck with me this far, then, well, yeah. Now, before we got the 2009 Zack Snyder film, Watchmen was one of those books that people thought was never going to be made into a movie. Like, it was considered to be unfilmable, but they had been trying to do a Watchmen movie for years. Apparently at some point in the 80s, after the comic was first published, 20th Century Fox actually acquired the rights to Watchmen, and apparently at one point Terry Gilliam was going to direct, and Terry Gilliam's a good director, but from everything I've heard about his Watchmen project... It, would, it might have been an interesting film on its own, but it would have been a god-awful Watchmen adaptation. Now, some of this information I got from podcasts that I listened to, so I don't know if all of this is true, but apparently Terry Gilliam wanted Arnold Schwarzenegger to play Dr. Manhattan, and apparently Robin Williams was going to play Rorschach, and apparently the comedian was going to be alive throughout the entire film. And apparently it was going to end where the characters from Watchmen enter a parallel universe, which turns out to be our world, and then they see themselves in a comic book. And I'm kind of glad that version of Watchmen never happened. Now, I know at some point in the early 2000s, I think Darren Aronofsky was going to do a Watchmen adaptation. Apparently at some point Tim Burton expressed interest in doing a Watchmen movie. But ultimately, in 2009, we got an adaptation of Watchmen directed by Zack Snyder, who also directed the Dawn of the Dead remake and 300, and he would go on to direct movies like Sucker Punch and Man of Steel and Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. Now, people give Zack Snyder a lot of shit, but Watchmen is honestly the reason I don't give Zack Snyder as much shit as everybody else does, because I do think Watchmen is honestly a really good good movie, and I do think it's Zack Snyder's best film. Now, the movie does leave out a lot from the book, and it also changes the ending, but to be honest with you, the changes that the movie made made sense for the movie. And the movie stays true to the general themes of Watchmen. Now, does it completely do justice to the book? I would say yes and no, but I do think it was the best possible adaptation we could have gotten, at least as a movie. I think to adapt Watchmen proper, it really should have been a miniseries. I think Zack Snyder did the best job he possibly could have, given the source material. Now, a lot of people still crap on the movie. A lot of fans of the comic crap on it because they feel like it doesn't do justice to the book. And then there are people who never read the comic who still crap on the movie because they just don't get it. 
And I remember when the movie came out, it got pretty polarizing reviews. There were some people who really didn't like it, and then there were some people who were absolutely praising it, some people even comparing it to movies like Blade Runner. But you know what? While it might not be a perfect adaptation, the best thing the movie did was it introduced me to the book. And as I said earlier in this video, Watchmen is now one of my top 10 favorite books of all time. So I will be forever grateful to this movie. There was some dead-on casting in that movie. You had Patrick Wilson as Daniel or Night Owl. You had Jackie Earl Haley as Rorschach, who in a lot of ways stole the freaking movie. And then you had Jeffrey D. Morgan as the comedian, and that was damn near perfect casting. He even looks a lot like how Dave Gibbons drew Edward Blake in the comic. Now, I know the Tales of the Black Freighter segments from the book were actually adapted into an animated film, and I believe the animated film was edited into the Ultimate Edition of Watchmen. Now, I've only seen the theatrical version of Watchmen, but I know there's the Director's Cut and then the Ultimate Edition. But I recommend the movie version of Watchmen. I honestly think it's a good film. And it has a kick-ass soundtrack. Now I want to cut to my friends again, given their thoughts on the movie version of Watchmen, starting with my friend Bill's short review on the Zack Snyder film. When it cuts back to me, I'm going to be talking about the 2019 HBO series. Uh, in terms of the adaptations, um, well, I, I thought Zack Snyder's film, I know a lot of people don't like it. I thought it was very good, actually. I thought that he was faced with an almost impossible task of taking such a, 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 a such a deep and, and, and rich work and bringing it into, making it to a you know two two and a half hour movie but I think he actually uh, I was amazed at the amount of things that he got from the series into that movie you know is it perfect no of course not but I think he gave it a really good try and I think he he was more successful than people give him credit for here's Christian Feliciano once again giving his thoughts on Zack Snyder's 2009 adaptation of Watchmen the only issue I have with this movie Watchmen is that it was done by Zack Snyder. Now, I don't hate Zack Snyder. I have nothing personally against him. It's just that every time I hear the name Zack Snyder, I think about BVS, and I get a headache. You know, BVS is just one of those movies that you just... You're embarrassed to know, you know, to know that it exists. You just feel embarrassed as a DC fan. DC is my favorite comic book company. I'm just really embarrassed by the BVS movie because especially with the Marvel movies out there, you know, it's just, it's just not a great movie, but this is not a BVS review. So, I mean, not, not go on about that. It's just that every time I hear Zack Snyder, I always think about BVS, but anyway, so Watchmen. Yes. I know a lot of people have problems with this movie. I know they have a problem with the ending, you know, but I love it for what it is. I love this movie to death. Um, I really do. I've watched it several times. Yes, the change at the ending was a little annoying because, you know, Zack Snyder says that, you know, he changed it because it would have took more time to explain the ending. No, it wouldn't have. I mean, even if it did, the movie was already two hours and whatever. Like, you could do a three-hour movie. It's no big deal. You could have just did it. But anyway, you know, I still love it for what it was. I love the changes they did. Um, you know, the way Dr. Ma Dr. Manhattan... Uh, <sighs> I don't want to spoil it, but I'll say the way Ozyman Diaz saves the world is cool. I, I, I found it acceptable for what it was. The way they did it was made sense. The acting, great, except for one. There's just one person, I, her acting I can't stand. It's the Silk Spectre, I think Malin Ackerman is her name. I can't stand her acting. Her acting is so bad in this, but the rest of the people save it. Everybody else is on the top of the game. Um, they're all doing fantastic acting. Pace-wise, it's fantastic. The slow motion, yeah, sometimes, you know, you get a little too much slow motion. But at the same time, it's great when you get the Rorschach dialogue, you know, uh, internal monologue scenes. You know, when he's going through his journal, which I love that he added that. Because for some reason, superhero movies don't do that. They don't ever put the internal monologue. I don't know why they should, but they don't. I love that, that you know, those slow motion scenes... There's sometimes where like an explosion happens, somebody turns around, and there's a slow motion. I'm like, why? But anyway, all right, I'll, I'll deal with it because you know what? The rest of the movie's good, and I love it. So screw it. I just I can deal with it. Special effects, amazing. I I can't believe the special effects in this movie at the time, especially when it came out. Like Dr. Manhattan looks great. The stuff that they do. I mean, there's a creature at some point that they show 
that's amazing. The, the 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 city it makes it look like 1985. It really looks like 1985 New York. I mean, I wasn't alive back then, but if you look at pictures or you look at documentaries, videos, that's what it looks like. I mean, it's great. You know, I love that he does keep with the um, story of a Watchman. Uh, speaking of 1985, like I love that he keeps it in that time, and he does keep the majority of the story the same. I, I love that he just goes through that. And he implies stuff that are is not in the in the movie, but in the book. You know, he implies some of it. So I love that. You know, I think that this is a great movie. It's definitely one of my favorite superhero movies. Um, just as a fan of Watchmen, I, I love it. But also as a fan of movies, I love this movie. It's just great. You know, as a fan of superheroes, it's great too because you get to see the realistic side of superheroes. Um, yes, I read the book before I watched the movie. But I still enjoyed it the same. Um, really enjoyed this movie. I bought it. I still have it. I watch it at least twice a year. It's just uh, fantastic. Yes, it's not for kids, though. Let me get this out of the way. It is not for kids. Uh, if you let your kids watch it, that's up to you. Um, because it is a violent movie. Just like the book, it is. There are sex scenes in it. So just be really cautious if you're going to let kids watch it. But I do recommend that everybody watch this movie. Um, it's great. Uh, check it out. You know, if you're just interested in it, if you've never seen it before, check it out. Especially now with the whole superhero genre taking over the Hollywood, uh, you know, ho taking over Hollywood. Um, check it out. You know, this will show you one of the first uh, real superhero movies, you know. Here's Jeremy giving his thoughts on the film version of Watchmen. Watchmen, directed by Zack Snyder. I saw this movie before reading the graphic novel, so I have it to thank for introducing me to it. I enjoy the movie very much, and I think it does a great job of adapting the graphic novel. I really love the opening credits, which have Bob Dylan's The Times. They are changing, playing, while showing the history of superheroes in this world. I enjoyed the cast in this movie, and my favorite performance was definitely Jackie Earl Haley as Rorschach. He brings this amazing and terrifying character to life, and he absolutely nails it. Everything about his performance is perfect, from his hoarse, gravelly voice to the way he delivers his lines. He really is the star of this movie. I also really enjoy watching Jeffrey Dean Morgan as the comedian. He's perfectly snarky and unpleasant, which is exactly what's needed to play such a despicable character. Billy Crudup is also great as Dr. Manhattan. I think he definitely nails Dr. Manhattan's detached nature and mannerisms. The fight scenes are great to watch and are perfectly violent and brutal. All in all, I think that this is a great adaptation of the graphic novel, and I've had the privilege of getting some of the actors, of meeting some of the actors, and getting them to sign my copy of Watchmen. Here's Billy Crudup's signature, there's Matthew Good's signature, and there's Patrick Wilson's signature. Well, I'm going to wrap it up here. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. Here's John once again giving his thoughts on the Zack Snyder film. I honestly actually really like the film, even though I wouldn't say it's the greatest thing or a masterpiece, but I really enjoyed it for what it was because I feel like this film gets a lot of like mixed opinions. In my opinion, it's really a good movie. Also, I tell them if you're going to watch it, watch the director's cut because the director's cut is way better than the theatrical cut when it came out because... I remember when it came out, I didn't see it in the theater because I wanted to read the comic first and then see the movie, which I did. And when I saw the director's cut, I'm like, this is how the film should have been when it came out. It was almost, I wouldn't say like 100%, it was almost exactly like the comic book that came to life. I love the performances of Jackie Early Haley as Rorschach, Billy Crudup, Malian Ackerman. They were just perfect. They really like nailed it. You really felt like they were there in front of you as if you wanted to talk to them, make conversation with them. Here are Chris's thoughts on Zack Snyder's 2009 adaptation of Watchmen. I do like the movie. Uh, I appreciate that it's a fairly straight adaptation. It doesn't try to do anything too crazy. It kind of just like, okay, here's the story for people who are not into comics. Like, here's basically what it is. And they streamline it in a way that makes sense at certain points. Um, instead of the alien falling on New York, just a nuke goes off, which 
I think it makes sense if you're gonna transfer it to film because that's a very weird, very Allen concept. <laughs> And I feel like people probably wouldn't have been able to take the movie seriously uh, had they done it ha as it was in the book. Um, so I think that change actually sort of makes sense if we're talking about, all right, we're going to adapt this as a mainstream blockbuster movie. Um, you could say something gets lost in the translation, and I suppose you'd be right. But um, I, I think on the whole, it's honestly a, a pretty decent movie i just it's one of those things where it's it's so faithful that you kind of wonder why you should watch it um as you know somebody who knows the story anyway but um i appreciate it you know it definitely opened up a whole new audience to the book and and new people found it and appreciated it which is always a good thing that's kind of a benefit of adaptations is you're going to get at least a decent amount of people who go back to the source material and then see that for what it is and separate it from whatever movie, TV show, or you know, animated series that it may, have, it may have come from. Now, in 2019, there was an HBO miniseries based on Watchmen. Now, when I first heard about this, I initially thought that this was going to be another adaptation of the graphic novel, but instead of that... This is actually a sequel to Watchmen, and instead of being a sequel to the Zack Snyder film, it's actually a sequel to the original graphic novel, like it's in continuity with that, ignoring the continuity of Doomsday Clock. Now, as much as I don't like the idea of doing a sequel to Watchmen, because that kind of spoils the ambiguous ending, where you don't really know what's going to become of the world of Watchmen after the events of the story... Honestly, the show feels like the logical continuation of what Alan Moore set up in the book. And honestly, I would count the show as canon before I count Doomsday Clock as being canon. And it's honestly a damn good series. Now, where the graphic novel was very much about the Cold War, the show is very much about race. The show opens up with the Tulsa race riots of 1921. And in the show, you find out that there's now a white supremacist group who are basing themselves off Rorschach. And it's just a really cool show. It is a show that you kind of have to read the comic in order to understand, because the show does act as a direct sequel to the comic. And some of the characters from the original graphic novel end up coming back, but you end up seeing these characters in a very different light. Now, in the comic, you find out about a character named Hooded Justice, who was the first costumed hero in the universe of Watchmen. And Hooded Justice's true identity was never actually revealed, but it was implied that he might have been a famous weightlifter who ended up getting murdered. But a lot of the show's plot is actually about who Hooded Justice really was. I recommend the show highly if you're a fan of the source material, and also the score from Trent Reznor is very Carpenter-esque. Now I'm going to cut to my friend Bill Burns, giving his thoughts on the HBO series. Um, as for the TV series, again, I thought I loved the TV series. I thought it was really, really good. Uh, it was very thought-provoking. I thought that uh, the series took uh, ideas from the original and sort of enhanced them in some ways, expanded them. So I thought it was a very much a worthy, um, uh, you know, um, sequel to it, a worthy extension of those ideas. Here's Christian again, giving his thoughts on the HBO series Watchmen. When it comes to Watchmen adaptions, I would have never thought that somebody would make a sequel to Watchmen. Now, yes... Yes, there are the sequel comic books that exist, which I can't believe exist. They're great, but don't get me you know, don't get me wrong. But I can't believe that somebody did a sequel to Watchmen, especially in the movies. I never would have thought they would ever do that. But let me tell you, the Watchmen HBO series, amazing. This is like one of the greatest shows of all time. I think it got canceled, which sucks, but I'm not sure about that, so don't quote me. But it, it, I mean, I can't believe what they were able to do with this. Uh, I can't believe how cool they made this, especially that, you know, it's it's really is a sequel. This takes place years after the first, the story, and it has stuff from the book in it and it has stuff from the movie as well. But the way they show where the world goes after the book 
is just mind blowing. I love that they bring race into this. I love that they they bring you know pr- pretty much today's politics into it, and it it oh my god they combine it so well. I'm so impressed by this movie. I hate the word impressed, but it's so impressive what they were able to do with this. I mean, it's, wow. I would have never thought about that. When I first heard about the Watchmen HBO series, I thought that um, they were going to do a, you know, a complete adaption of the book. I thought they were going to just do it, you know, scene for scene, um, you know, page for page. But no. And, and in fact, I was a little upset about it. But at the same time, when I saw what they were able to do with it, I'm like, nah, I like this better. So and I don't mean better as in it's better than the original Watchmen book. No, I don't believe I don't believe that. I still like the original Watchmen better, but I just mean it's better than just doing another adaption of Watchmen. Like, this was a better idea, more creative. Uh, the characters in it, fantastic. Uh, I love how they were able to take things like uh, Rorschach's mask and change the symbol of it, you know, really go into the fact that he was a conservative, things that people don't bring up for some reason. Like, <laughs> they were able to bring that into the real world, like what a conservative is today compared to back then, and... and change his message around to fit into their way now you know the 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 way conservative is now you know conservatism is now i love that they were able to do that um i love that it also goes after some liberal ideas you know there's a part in the beginning which i won't spoil much but i'm just gonna say this one scene because i love this um i love that it attacks all sides you know liberals always talk about you know gun control and stuff like that and then you have um uh, uh, or, or cops shooting people out of nowhere, you know, which I hate too, but let's just, I'm just going with the, what the series shows you. Um, there's a scene where the guy, where one of the cops, he gets into some trouble, goes to get his gun, but the gun lock that liberals would love for, I guess, cops to have, I guess, is not working. So he can't get the gun, so he can't stop the crime. And it shows the bad part about that. Like that, oh, that was just, I mean, I don't want to get excited, but that was just I was like, whoa, like, that was cool. Like, how they just went all over the place with that. Like, they just completely just showed you, you know, stayed neutral on that. Like, they attacked both sides. I know some people say, oh, it's a big liberal agenda thing. No, this, if you really watch it, it, it attacks all sides. You know, it shows you the, the politics of today and the absurdity of it. And then, of course, um, you know, it has characters from the past. I won't get into it, but just, um, you know, one of my favorite, my favorite character anyway, of this show is Jeremy Irons, uh, who he plays. I'm not going to spoil who he plays, but just know that I love him in this show. Another character shows up at some point and he looks different now, which is cool the way they do it. I love that he looks so different and he's an actor that I love to death. Um, he was also in uh, another superhero movie, but I can't say it because I don't want to spoil anything. Like, if you've never seen this, just anyway, just go watch it. And I'm sure you'll you'll pick up what I'm trying to say here. Um, Acting, brilliant, writing, pacing, everything about it is just fantastic. It gets you, too. It really just irks you sometimes. It really pulls at your heartstrings, and it really pisses you off sometimes because when you see injustice go on and you see all these horrible things go on, oh, it's just, oh, I love this book. I love this show so much. Great show. Watchmen, one of the greats. Uh, Please check it out. It's amazing. And, yeah, thank you so much. Bye-bye. So yeah, that was my review on Alan Moore's Watchmen slash a discussion on the adaptations. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you enjoyed my friend's commentaries, and bye.